If you're just joining us, welcome to Ensuring Quality in your online course. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to get started with the workshop today. I'll try to move quickly and maybe I can even get you out a few minutes early. So I'd like to actually hear a little bit from all of you. If you want to go ahead and find that text chat or if you prefer the microphone, you can turn that on. But what's your name? What do you teach? And specifically, do you, you have any uh, hopes for this workshop and what you'd like to get out of it? Yes, I'll go ahead and get started. Can you hear me? I sure can. This is Lori Ziddle. Uh, I teach in the area of adapted physical activity. My department is kinesiology and physical education. I'm currently teaching a course for the first time that is completely asynchronous, uh, one of my grad courses. Uh, so I'm hoping to gain more information about how to put that together and have a quality course. Excellent. I have some resources for you. And of course, I will be emailing you a whole list of resources after the workshop as well. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. All right, I see some activity in the chat. So Jen teaches kinesiology and physical education. Lori and Chris. Oh, good. Lots of kinesiology folks. Um, and you teach in-person and hybrid classes primarily. Wonderful. What isn't a hybrid course anymore? All right, and Brandon is from Special and Early Education and is hoping to learn more about getting student involvement in online synchronous courses. Okay. Hey, hi, can you hear me okay? This is Michelle Kachka. Yes, I can. Okay, so I'm Michelle Kachka. I teach in the Department of Marketing in the College of Business. Uh, a lot of different preparations. I've taught hybrid, online, in person, and I'm just really hoping to see, you know, if to validate some things I'm doing and to pick up um, some new things too and then just improve the quality of my online courses. Excellent. Okay, wonderful. And I think I see one other person in the text chat here. JC teaches online business consulting courses. Most are synchronous format and just hoping for some new ideas. All right. I promise we're going to have a lot of great resources too. So um, again, if you just logged in, we'll have those in a follow up email after the, the workshop. So either today or tomorrow, depending on how fast I move. Hi, uh, Chris Hill here, also as from KMPE as well. Um, so I teach both in person as well as online asynchronous classes. And really, I just want to see where my decrements are and just stuff I can really improve on. Wonderful. Thanks, Chris. All right. Well, you guys have given me a good challenge. So let's see if we can come up with this um, today and give you some good ideas. And I did promise it's going to be interactive. So. All right. Here are some of our, our goals. How are we going to define quality, measure it? and also evaluate quality. Um, we are a quality matters institution. And if you're not sure what that is, don't worry, that's on the agenda. So we're gonna talk about what is quality matters versus what are they not, the eight different categories of QM standards, then there's gonna be the activity. Um, and then we're gonna talk a little bit about how we're evaluating um, online course quality at an institutional level. So we're going to look at NIU quality essentials um, and some different workshops that are available. There is kind of the formal Q&A at the end, but feel free to chime in anytime you have a question. You can, again, just type in the chat or turn on your microphone. All right, so here's a little bit of a brainstorm for you. Um, when we think of quality online education, who are the people who have an investment in this? Who are the stakeholders when it comes to that online course quality? And you can go ahead and just type in the chat, whatever comes to mind, or the microphone.
All right, seeing lots of answers coming in. Okay, so I see a lot of different votes for the students and the learners, also the instructors. Chris, I like this idea of faculty as it's part of the evaluation to maintain employment. Oh, and then I, I would hazard to guess that those who are evaluating us also have a stake in it. Okay. So here are some other people that are kind of invested in this process with us. And right away, everybody thought of the learners, the students, the teachers, um, certainly the administrators. We also have accrediting agencies. Uh, this is a big part of it. Um, I think that's kind of what Chris was alluding to there. The universities or the institutions as a whole. And then of course, because at NIU, we're a public state institution, um, the taxpayers. So they're also um, invested in our quality online education. So there's a lot of different players and kind of moving parts to this. So let's talk about getting to know quality matters uh, because we're going to use this as our, our baseline for establishing online course quality. So I think I mentioned earlier, Northern Illinois University is a quality matters institution. Um, I think we have been with them since we want to say 2014. So it, it's been a while. Uh, but quality matters is this nationally recognized faculty driven peer review process. And they do this to ensure the quality of online and blended courses. Um, so blended courses can mean a lot of different things. It, it could mean hybrid courses. Um, it could mean the types of courses where students have an opportunity to sit in person or online. Um, so it covers a lot of ground. But Quality Matters is really this group and they want us to keep evaluating online courses. It's not this idea that you've just reached your peak and you're done. Uh, it, it's this set of standards that continues to evolve. And so they want us to keep reevaluating our online courses and looking for ways to improve. Um, and they're not about perfection, uh, but they are about, you know, kind of hitting a, a certain goal. And we'll talk about what that goal is here in just a moment. So we always talk about the underlying principles of quality matters. So the four C's, right? It's continuous. Um, once your course has been quality matter certified, um, it's going to last for several years, um, but then they want you to, to reapply and have your course re-reviewed. It's very student-centered. So everything that they talk about with course quality, um, again, is to improve the learning process for our students. Collegial and collaborative, honestly, I think go hand in hand. So collegial is really this idea that somebody is going to be reviewing your course um, who's also in the field of higher education. Um, and most recently, Quality Matters now has uh, issued the statement that you're not just being reviewed for course quality from other instructors. Um, they're also looking at it from the stance of people like instructional designers. So uh, we know that there's a bunch of people who are invested in quality online education. And so it's your peers who are helping set these standards and to review your course. And again, I think collaborative goes hand in hand with that. Uh, when somebody reviews your course at Quality Matters, they give you a ton of feedback. And I, I do mean a ton, I've seen it. It's uh, really extensive. So um, again, they want to invite you into the conversation about how you can improve your course. I think I've got, what is it, seven boxes up here on the screen. So these are the different components of course quality. And so this is um, everything that's kind of embedded into a course quality review. So when we talk about the course design, we're talking about the physical layout that students see when they enter an online course. You know, do they have a welcome page? Are there modules? Is there some sort of structure or sequence to how they access their content? The course delivery actually refers to the instruction itself. And then the course content are the items within your course. So that could be text, images, 
video, audio, it could be many different things. Uh, the course management system. So again, at NIU, we use Blackboard. Um, I think many of us are already using Blackboard Ultra, but if you haven't, um, that's what we're moving towards for the spring of 2024. And then, of course, we have kind of these last three here. So the university infrastructure. Um, not everybody can offer an online course. Uh, not every institution is equipped to do that. So you have to think about it broadly um, as, a, as an entire um, institution. Faculty readiness is looking at, are your faculty equipped to teach? Have they ever taught before? Uh, do you have resources available for them? Faculty development, things of that nature. And also our student readiness. Do our students know what they're getting into when they sign up for an online course? So, and do we have tools to support them? So these are kind of all the different components that are embedded in this review process. All right, so we know these are all the different things that are working as Quality Matters goes about telling us how we should approach online course quality. But here's a couple of things that it's not. So um, when we talk about this big, huge group, this big organization and how they set the standards for uh, looking at online course quality, they say that it's not about the instructor. That's the first and foremost. So um, QM is not a faculty evaluation. It, it's strictly about the course quality. Nobody ever uses a Quality Matters uh, review to determine whether or not somebody is equipped to teach a course. Uh, it is, again, not about the individual instructor. It's just about the course design. It's also not a pass or fail test. So if you ever decide that you really want to see if your course meets Quality Matter um, review standards, you can ask somebody to review your course. It's actually going to be a team of three people. Um, and they will tell you whether or not um, you met their standards. But even if you did not meet their standards on the first try, you're encouraged to revise your course and resubmit. So um, really, it's just this ongoing cycle. It's never about pass or fail. And I think I mentioned earlier, QM is not about perfection. So they score each of their standards, which we're going to get into here in just a moment. Um, but to them, they said it's not about perfection. They just want you to meet 85% of their criteria or above. Um, and if you meet 85% of their criteria or above, then you get the Quality Matters course certification. So I know I've done a little bit of talking here. Um, questions so far, or have any of you heard of QM? Worked with them at all? Nothing yet? Okay. Sounds pretty quiet. Chris, you've not heard or worked with them. So Quality Matters um, actually started out as a very small group. I think it was out of um, Maryland, I want to say. And so it was a group of people who were invested in higher education, um, and they were trying to solve the problem of what constitutes a quality online course. Um, so first they had to determine what these standards were, what is the exact criteria for determining an online course, and then it evolved into an even bigger group where they said, um, you know, we'll come through as a team of three people and we'll evaluate your course for you. Excellent. So Michelle has worked with QM when they were first brought to NIU. Wonderful. So, um, as I mentioned, Quality Matters keeps uh, changing, keeps evolving. They just came out with the seventh edition of their Quality Matters rubric. So that's basically the criteria that we look at when we evaluate an online course. Um, it just came out this summer. So we're actually getting ready to update all of our websites to correspond with their updates. Uh, so again, like I said, everybody keeps going through the cycle. They continue to improve, and so they want instructors to keep improving their courses as well. Um, but once a course achieves Quality Matters certification, uh, the course is certified for five years. And then the course representative, and that's usually the instructor of record, can recertify 
or they can restart the review cycle for an additional three years of certification. So quality matters, they, they want to look at mature courses, courses that instructors have taught several times, because they know that there are some kinks that we have to work out, you know, when you first develop a course. Um, when something is brand new, there's some growing pains with it. So they really want you to have taught the course several times and to feel confident, you know, kind of going into the review process. And currently there are over 1,300 institutions nationwide that subscribe to QM. I think it's nationwide. I'll have to double check that. It could be worldwide. So, um, oh, and I, I know this is kind of a, a small um, diagram. It got a little blurry. That was as big as I could get it. Uh, but this is just the general cycle. So you start with your course, you build it, um, you ask for it to be reviewed by a team of three people. Um, th one of the three people is guaranteed to be a subject matter expert. So if you're a biology um, instructor, you can expect a fellow um, science instructor on the, on the committee. Uh, but they would review your course. They're going to provide feedback whether or not you achieve certification the first time or not. Um, and then if you don't receive the certification on the first go round, you can revise it until you do meet their standards. So Michelle, that's a great question. How many courses at NIU are currently QM certified? None. Uh, so we're, we're hoping to change that pretty soon. I know it's a shocking number. I'm sure you were expecting a higher number than that. We had a big QM movement um, and then right when we got into the pandemic it, it was kind of like it took a back seat so um, we kind of have a renewed interest in our online course quality so just to reiterate quality matters at niu it's a guiding standard for our quality course design uh, we use this especially with our own instructional design team uh, we adhere to their standards if you ever decide to have your course reviewed by a Quality Matters team, just understand that it's completely voluntary. Um, you know, your, your department chair can never mandate that you um, have your course reviewed by Quality Matters or anything like that. And it is just the growing community of faculty who are committed to quality online courses. So um, you, you join a larger network of even people within your own institution. Okay, so I promised that this was going to be interactive, so uh, we're gearing up for it here. Uh, these are what is called the general quality matter standards. I call them categories. Um, you can think of it how you like, uh, maybe, maybe buckets is a better word, I'm not sure. Um, but so here are the eight different categories. Um, and these are what they say constitutes a quality online course. So the course overview and introduction, your learning objectives, assessments and measurements, instructional materials, course activities and learner interaction, course technology, learner support, and accessibility and usability. And so these um, eight categories, these eight general standards uh, are what comprise online course quality. Within each of these eight categories, there are further substandards. Um, so it ends up being a total of, I think, with the newest seventh edition rubric, 44 standards total. Um, and they say that you should meet, you know, 85% or above of these standards to, to prove that you have a quality online course, which is a lot. So um, we're just gonna take a, maybe an overview, a little bit of a peek at that today. So if you're wondering though, um, and again, I promise I have all of the follow-up material coming after this workshop. Um, but we do also have the list of these quality um, matter standards on our website. So I can send that to you as well. This again, it was just a, a nice picture kind of to show you how alignment works in quality manner and quality matters. They're, they're very focused on alignment. So they want to show how everything connects. Um, so that base really is the learning objectives. That's the foundation for everything in your course. If you don't have strong learning objectives, uh, the rest of the pillars could crumble. Uh, but then that kind of turns into your instructional materials, the interaction and engagement, and the course technology. Um, so those three pillars help support assessment and measurement. And we'll show you what that looks like. 
If you are wondering, uh, we do actually have QM rubrics, and so we have a bunch of them um, now at the CIDL office. In fact, with the new 7th edition rubric, uh, we got a brand new batch. So if you're ever interested in getting a QM rubric, let us know uh, so we can send one out to you. But that is actually what it looks like. So this is their scoring guide, right? Um, remember I said that we had those eight categories and underneath it, there were 44 uh, substandards. Well, they, they give them point values. And so they say that, you know, if it, something is essential to an online course, it's worth three points, very important is two, and just important is a singular point. Um, so they said, you know, if you ever want your course reviewed by Quality Matters, you have to achieve 85% of each standard. Um, so basically you have to get all of the essential standards and then you can just mix and match the very important and the important standards until you achieve a score of 80%, 85% or higher. But now we're going to actually take a look at that, right? Everybody keeps telling us that we should strive for course quality, but what does it look like? Um, so these are some of the things that they're going to be evaluating you on. I took one of their criterions from each of those eight um, general standards. So now we get to have you take a look at these. From the course overview and introduction, they said this is one of the very first things that students have to see when they enter your course. Instructions must make clear how to get started and where to find various course components. How would online instructors set this up? The other one that follows it um, after that is, um, I should have said it was 1.2, but learners are introduced to the purpose and structure of the course. Okay, I see some different things going on here. Michelle, you said course schedule and a map. What kind of a map are we talking about? Um, just on where to find things. I usually put in like something like at the beginning, um, a folder that just tells you where to go for things. And the um, course schedule has what's like what's in every single module. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. I wasn't sure if we were talking about a campus map. I was like, well, oh, no, no, no. I just meant like for the course, <laughs> the, like the schedule, and it tells you exactly like what's in each module. Yes, absolutely. I see a bunch of follow-up comments here. A module zero, uh, create a module saying start here. Absolutely. A recorded video and email communication. JC, I love that. That is one of the um, things that they stress from Quality Matters. Um, Students often feel disconnected in online courses, uh, maybe from their peers or from their instructor. And so if they can see your face or they can hear your voice, uh, it, it really helps kind of bring that human element to your online class. And so that is something that they stress that uh, you should have in your, your course. So yes, I love all of these answers. Learners are introduced to the purpose and the structure of the course. Yes, the syllabus, absolutely. Um, you know, how are they going to be graded? Uh, what is the breakdown of their the course? And what are your expectations? Wonderful. Some other things that you can include in there is, you know, what they can expect from you. How fast do you grade? What is your um, what is your turnaround time for emails? Things like that. Absolutely. So this one, uh, they just changed the wording a little bit, but um, this has always been in the rubric. So learning objectives and competencies. The second one is that the course level learning objectives describe outcomes that are measurable. This can be tricky, but how do you know if your course learning objectives are measurable? Mm 
Ayan. When you look at your own syllabus and you look at your course learning objectives, did you write those? Did you, some of you may have different answers for this. Um, were they written by your department? Okay, some different answers in here. Some of you wrote them with department input. Others said that they came from their department. Um, this does vary at NIU from department to department. Uh, typically, when we think about course learning objectives, um, there can be different layers of course learning objectives. There could be the ones in the syllabus, and those are the learning objectives that you have for your students. Um, there can also be smaller learning objectives as well. Those could be the learning objectives maybe that you have for weekly units or modules. Typically, when we write learning objectives, we want them to be written from the student perspective. So you could say by the end of this week or by the end of this course, students will be able to. Um, and then you start listing specific functions and tasks that they can be responsible for. We also want to think about using um, action verbs. That's typically one of the things that you'll notice with strong learning objectives. Um, we want to look at what the students are doing, and we want to look at behaviors that we can actually observe and, upset and assess. So it could be writing essays. It could be presenting material. It could be solving problems, right? When we look at learning objectives, we want to avoid vague statements. These are things that are kind of subjective and difficult to assess. So um, you might want to stay away from things like, by the end of this course, students should know how to do something, or students should appreciate the subject matter. That's one that I've seen before. Um, so again, try to think of actual behaviors that we can watch and we can observe. And I will send out some different um, links as well for learning objectives, but these are typically things that um, require the students to take some type of an action. Do these sound familiar before? Has anyone ever told you the, the difference between, you know, learning objectives versus um, maybe goals for a course? So the learning objectives are for our students. Goals um, are oftentimes the goals that we set for ourselves as instructors. You know, I might say that one of my goals is I want at least 80% of my students to pass the class. I wouldn't necessarily write that into my, um, into my syllabus, but they're also good to write out just so that I, I can make sure that everything in my course aligns. All right, let's try this one. Assessment and measurement. So this is their specific review standard 3.3. Specific and descriptive criteria are provided for the evaluation of learners' work and their connection to the course grading policy is clearly explained. Where would this evidence be observed in your course? So if somebody were to review your course, how would they find that information? Yes, rubrics, the syllabus, absolutely. I was always an English instructor, so uh, for me it's uh, detailed assignment prompts, what are, maybe I expected my students to write in an essay. Absolutely. 
And having those rubrics can be a game changer too for saving time while you're grading. So if you haven't tried interactive rubrics yet in Blackboard, um, that could really help your workflow. Okay. Instructional materials. Jen, I love this. Um, you know, having a rationale, yes, for why the students are doing this assignment and what they should expect to get out of it, essentially why this matters. Absolutely. Uh, that also plays into how everything is interconnected in your course, maybe how assignment one connects to assignment two, or even bigger than that. It could be what they're doing in this course could do to impact future studies as well. Yes, absolutely. It's all part of the alignment. All right, we'll try instructional materials. Um, so the instructional materials contribute to the achievement of the stated learning objectives. I'd like to hear your ideas on this. Um, how would somebody, a stranger in your course, know that you, the instructional materials uh, contribute to the achievement of the stated learning objectives? Essentially, if that team of Quality Matters experts came in and reviewed your course. You can think about what kind of content do you upload in your course? Brandon, under my course objectives, I, I list the assignments and readings that accomplish those objectives. That's a great way to do it. Um, Quality Matters is really big on mapping out those connections. Um, so they like to know how you know an activity supports a course learning objective or how that particular piece of content supports a specific learning objective. Michelle says, I have aligned learning objectives with assignments in the syllabus, but I've not aligned the materials per se. Yes, I, I know it's so much to think about, um, but it does give us, you know, pause to consider. Are there additional materials that we want to incorporate? How often do we update them? Sometimes we just keep reusing the same materials, but there's always this opportunity to, to continue to expand and to update our course as well. JC, it's all about improvement for everybody. So, um, you know, I do like this idea about readings and resources, um, but it also can be other things. It could be visual images, it could be podcasts, it could be uh, videos or lectures that you've recorded. So again, we have all these different types of instructional materials um, that we can look at that will help our students achieve these goals. Ah, a learning activities folder. Well, it's funny that you should say that because I know we've just arrived at number five, the course activities and learn, learner interaction. So this one, I actually have two questions for you. Um, the general standard 5.1, the learning activities promote the achievement of the stated learning objectives or competencies. I have a sample here for you. So if your objective was to synthesize complex concepts and apply critical thinking skills, what types of activities would be appropriate? Here we go again with those active verbs. So that's the first question. And the second one that I have for you is how are learning activities different from assessments? And you can respond in whichever order you like, whichever question calls to you.
Jen, I like this response. Learning activities are about the process. Assessments are about the product. I think you're on the right train here. All right. Learning activities are readings, presentations, and training you must do to complete the assignments for the week or build on previous weeks. I like all of these answers, yes. Um, learning activities are how we teach students to acquire a skill while assessments are about checking for mastery, yes. So when Quality Matters comes through and they review your course, they, they look at two things. They look at course activities and then they look at uh, course assessments and they do divide them into two distinct categories. Um, so another way to think about this is that the activities these are often the practice activities. They are low or no stakes um, activities that students can engage in. So this is where they can feel comfortable experimenting because they know that this is not um, something that's really going to impact their grade. So yes, it's all about preparing them for those future assessments. All right. Anyone want to take a stab at the first one? If your objective for an assignment was to synthesize complex concepts and apply critical thinking skills, what type of activity would be appropriate? I hope that our college students learn some critical thinking skills. I think they do. Presentations, sure. Uh, uh. Could be a lot of different things. Could be journal activities, could be reflections. I would say that anything where we ask our students to synthesize complex concepts is this idea where they have to walk through some sort of a complex scenario. Um, so something that would not be appropriate would be, say, a matching or a multiple choice question. Um, those things that showed to me that they, they are misaligned. Um, and again, when we ask them to apply critical thinking skills, um, that usually means that they have to come up with some sort of original response. Um, so again, this is all about students contributing their own work. Um, whether they've solved some sort of an equation, um, they've come up with a, a hypothesis that they've yet to test. Um, it could be in many, many different things. Um, but it is, again, this idea that they are the ones who are generating their own work. Great. Uh -huh. All right. So number six, the course technology. The tools used in this course support the learning objectives. How do you know if the right tool has been selected? Um, what are the signs that the tool does not align? Maybe, maybe you've seen evidence of this, even if you think back to when you were a student, or, or maybe you, you've observed another class where you thought, maybe that's not the best resource. What influences your decisions? That's a good one. If NIU supports the tool, such as Qualtrics for surveys, excellent. If you're stumped on this one, maybe think of some of the course technology that you use in your course. Some of you said you have asynchronous courses. Some of you said you have synchronous courses. Um, where do you meet and, and how do you communicate?
All right, I see a little bit of silence on this one. Um, course technology sometimes can be a tricky one. I often think of course technology with starting with the, um, the activity first. JC, I like that you use Zoom or Teams uh, to meet because students will likely see that in the business world. That's great. Uh, you know, that's exposing them to something that they're likely to see in their own profession. That's a wonderful choice. I think we often have to look at what are our goals? What do we what do we want out of class that day? You know, what is our, our goal for the week and what is our goal for the course? Um, and then choosing the piece of technology that appropriately supports that. Um, if we pick out a piece of technology first and then uh, write our, our daily plan around it, um, it, it may cause some an alignment there. Um, you might see areas where um, you started to veer off topic. So there's so much technology out on the market right now. I, I think everybody's talking about um, AI and chat GPT. Um, you know, those are great tools. Um, if they support the lesson plan that you've already developed. Great. We've got two left. So for learner support, and this is general review standard 7.4, course instructions articulate or link to the institution's student services and resources that can help learners succeed in their courses. Specifically, what are these resources at NIU? See writing lab, DRC, student counseling services, um, advisors. So NIU has a bunch of different resources. Um, one of the things that you may or may not have seen um, is this idea of Blackboard Assist. Do it, excellent. Yes, these these are great. Um, the next time you're in Blackboard, if you log in on the left side of your screen, look under um, where it says courses. You'll scroll down, you'll see something that says assist. Um, I think it has like a little rocket uh, emblem or, or icon. Um, so we've now compiled a place where all of the most up-to-date information is stored for our students. So you don't have to worry about making sure that your link to the DRC is, is still correct um, and, you know, updating all of these links at once. We compiled all of these resources and put it into one area for you. So um, if you have a chance, look at Blackboard Assist. It's a great place to refer your students. Um, it'll give them things like tutoring, the DRC, the first year success series, counseling, access to things like the Student Health Center, Career Services, the library. Um, so that's a great place to refer your students. Um, we, we have some other things too. Um, we also have something called the NIU Student Life Site, and then there's the Student Success um, Tips and Tools. So let's see. I can even drop these into the chat for you, but I can send these also in a follow-up uh, email. So I sent those um, in the text chat, but these are additional resources that you can share with your students just to help optimize their chances for success in your course as well as others. All right, last one. So accessibility and usability. I always think this is a great one. Text in the course is accessible. How do you determine this and what are good strategies to ensure text accessibility?
oftentimes, um, just as a hint, when we think about text and being accessible, um, it's if they can be um, detected and read by e-reader devices. Great, I see all these things. Yes, Ultra gives you a score. So now anytime you upload a document, you might see kind of like, a, it looks like a little meter and the more accessible your score, um, it turns green. If something is not accessible by e-reader standards, it turns red, but you can click on it and you can find out how to, um, how to improve that accessibility score. So um, these are all great things that, that I see popping up in the chat here. Um, oftentimes, if you have a text uh, document, you might want to use things like headers and titles. Um, so somebody who has an e-reader device knows like when they've gotten to the title of a document or, or kind of like a, a subsection. Uh, fix the captions on your videos. Yes, that's actually an entirely, um, they've now turned that into another um, review standard. So I think that is um, review standard 8.5. Uh, multimedia in the course is um, easy to, or I'm sorry, video and audio content in the course is accessible. So some other things that you can try to do is um, sometimes I, I've seen um, we might have old photocopies of um, text documents, you know, something that you took off of a printer and then you uploaded it. Those tend to be very fuzzy and difficult for somebody um, who has any type of visual impairment to to see. So another um, thing that you can do here is you could work with your librarian and see if they could just find uh, something from maybe an interlibrary loan or some sort of e-resource um, that's a little bit cleaner and neater um, for your students to access and that's also free. Okay, so you've survived the interactive activity. So now let's take a look at this um, from the institution standpoint. So we have something called the NIU Quality Essentials. Quality matters, uh, that course review process is really intense. And so I would recommend that you ease your way into it. So um, one of the things that we would uh, recommend that you start with is our own internal review that we've built. So, what does this look like and how do you work towards quality matters? Um, well, you can start with the NIU quality essentials and I'll show you that in just a moment. And then there are some other things that you can do. There's the um, Blackboard um, Excellence and Course Program Review. And then there's quality matters. Um, so I would probably go through two of the smaller course reviews first um, to, to acclimate your way up to quality matters since they're kind of the, the leading standard in online course quality. So we have created um, a scaled down, simplified version of Quality Matters. And the way this works is you can actually go to our website for Quality Essentials, you'll log in. Um, it's very simple and you can just save your password. So you'll conduct a self-review. You will look at all of our criteria and you will self-evaluate whether or not you think your course um, meets that criteria. Optionally, you can go to the third step and you can request that somebody here at the NIU uh, Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning will review your course. When that happens, we'll go in and we'll look at your self-review as well as your online course. Um, and we're going to determine if you meet all of our review standards. We always provide feedback. And then um, if you meet our standards, you'll go on to get the Quality Essentials course recognition. Um, and if not, you're invited to revise your course and to resubmit your application. And we want to see what this looks like. So this is our website, the Quality Essentials Course Review. And as you can see, there's a little red button on the right screen, side of the screen that says submit your course for review. So um, again, this is really kind of a, a nice way just for you to self-assess your course. Um, we took the quality essential standards and we scaled it down because we thought, you know, 44 is a lot of standards. So we took the ones that we thought were the most important and we said that these are essential to having an NIU course um, meeting the, the online course quality standards. 
And you can use this for online courses. You can also use this for hybrid courses. So it, it works in either scenario. Um, and again, if you don't want us to review your course, you can just stop at the self-review. Um, so then it's just yours and nobody else is looking at it. So here are the benefits of the course review. Uh, you get a digital badge. So that's actually what that little circle looks like. Um, that's the, the digital badge. And you can optionally display that in your course for your students to see, or you can hide it. It's up to you. You also get notified um, by the Office of the Provost. So this goes directly to your chair. So um, this is a great you know, recognition. Also, if any of you are considering going for tenure track positions, this is something you may want to go for. And then the Quality Essentials website recognition um, includes the Excellence in Online Teaching Award and also Blackboard Exemplary Course Program review winners as well. So um, this is where your name is publicly displayed so that everyone at NIU can see that you've received this recognition. So um, currently we had, um, what was it? I think it was like 23 standards that we said were um, essential. And then 19 of them were um, exemplary, but encouraged. So we took, um, we cut down almost the quality matters review standards in half. Um, but since they came out with the seventh edition rubric, we're probably going to revise that just a little bit to incorporate changes that they've made. So be on the lookout for that. Um, but it's really kind of a great way to see if you have the components um, from what other professionals in the field say are necessary for achieving online uh, course quality. So ooh, perfect timing. We've got about five minutes left. I can answer any questions. If you'd like to see anything, you can always try to demo something. Um, if there's any questions, feel free to hop on the mic. Otherwise, I can give you back a couple minutes of your afternoon. I'm going to turn off the recording.